The Holocaust, or Shoah, was a massive genocide carried out by Nazi Germany to cleanse the human population of undesirable elements and create a master Aryan race. Adolf Hitler formulated the roots of this doctrine in Mein Kampf, 1925, in which he wrote, The psyche of the great masses is not receptive to half measures or weakness. The masses love the ruler rather than the suppliant, and inwardly they are far more satisfied by a doctrine which tolerates no rival than by the grant of liberal freedom. Thus they see only the inconsiderate force, the brutality and the aim of its manifestations to which they finally always submit. A stronger generation will drive out the weaklings because in its ultimate form, the urge to live again and again break the ridiculous fetters of a so-called humanity of the individual so that its place will be taken by the humanity of nature which destroys weakness in order to give its place to strength. He who is strongest in courage and industry receives, as nature's favorite child, the right to be the master of existence. Hitler believed that history is driven by great races, of which the finest is the Aryan. The noblest Aryans, according to Hitler, were the Germans, who should rule the world. The Nazis, who were the master race, had to use war and force, the proper instruments of the strong, to achieve their goals. In Hitler's mind, the Jews were evil incarnate, democracy was decadent, and communism was criminal. Hitler, the ultimate demagogue, was able to tailor the delivery of his ideas to suit whichever audience he was addressing. During his rise to power, he was supported by aristocratic nationalists and powerful industrialists who were afraid of a leftist revolution in Germany. His propaganda guru, Joseph Goebbels, used every communications device available to convert the masses to Nazism. And the Sturmabteilung, or brown shirts, was the paramilitary wing of the Nazi party that intimidated and bullied enemies of the party. Once Hitler was firmly in power, the enabling act was enacted, giving him the right to rule by decree for the next four years. All opposition parties were crushed and the Weimar Constitution was put aside. Of particular interest to Hitler was the complete eradication of the Jewish race and its culture. When Hitler came to power in 1933, approximately 9 million Jews lived in 21 countries that were later occupied by Germany during World War II. The largest populations were concentrated in Eastern Europe. In Germany, Jews comprised less than 1% of the country's population. Playing on centuries of deep-seated antisemitism in the European culture, he spelled out his motives and ultimate mission. The Jew uses every possible means to undermine the racial foundations of a subjugated people. In his systematic efforts to ruin girls and women, he strives to break down the last barriers of discrimination between him and other peoples. For as long as a people remain racially pure and are conscious of the treasure of their blood, they can never be overcome by the Jew. Never in this world can the Jew become master of any people except a bastardized people. Should the Jew, with the aid of his Marxist creed, triumph over the people of this world, his crown will be the funeral wreath of mankind, and this planet will once again follow it, Orber, through ether, without any human life on its surface, as it did millions of years ago. And so I believe today that my conduct is in accordance with the will of the Almighty Creator, in standing guard against the Jew, I am defending the handiwork of the Lord. In addition to over six million Jews of Europe, the Nazis murdered at least four million undesirables, including a quarter of a million gypsies or Roma, Sinti, homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, and mental defectives. Several million Soviet prisoners of war were also murdered, often after being tortured. The brutality of murdering countless numbers of unarmed men, women, and children in conquered nations was a feature of the Nazi regime. Under the new order, 
Poles, Czechs, Serbs, and Russians were to become subject peoples. But the Jews alone were the one race to be eradicated entirely. A Jew was defined as anyone with at least one Jewish grandparent. And thus the Nazi bureaucracy utilized the tools of a modern state to accomplish this mission. The police force, the railways, civil service, the industrial forces, and the military were mobilized. And the most important apparatus that helped to carry out this goal was a massive campaign of deception. Hitler felt that the forces of modernity, specifically those under the leadership of a Jewish intellectual, was going to exterminate the Aryan race. The Nazis thus undertook a calculated effort to manipulate culture by controlling what people read, heard, and watched. Joseph Goebbels inaugurated a program to align German culture with Nazi ideals. He enlisted university students to lead the movement. And on April 6, 1933, the German Student Association proclaimed a nationwide action against the un-German spirit. In 12 theses, they demanded the establishment of a pure national culture as opposed to the spread of what they dubbed Jewish intellectualism. On the night of May 10th, students staged a national march in most university towns which culminated in the burning of more than 25,000 volumes of un-German books. After Hitler assumed power in 1933, the Jews suffered political, social, and economic discrimination. Antisemitism became the official German policy. In 1935, the so-called Nuremberg Laws came into effect, which deprived Jews of the Third Reich of most of their civil rights and dispossessed them of their legal rights and their occupational opportunities. Jews had their German citizenship revoked. Intermarriage and extramarital relationships between Jews and non-Jews was forbidden, and Jews were prohibited from writing, publishing, creating art, giving concerts, acting on stage or screen, teaching, working in a bank or hospital, and selling books. In this climate of intensifying hatred, Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, occurred when Nazi sympathizers smashed the windows of 7,500 shops and burned 267 synagogues, killing 91 people. A network of concentration camps in Germany was instituted for political opponents and other undesirables. After Poland was invaded in 1939, over 42,000 ghettos were established to segregate the Jews from the European population. The ghettos were a transitional phase in the so-called final solution to the Jewish problem. Reinhard Heydrich issued a directive on September the 21st, 1939, stating that the first prerequisite for the fulfillment of the final aim was to concentrate Jews from the countryside into the larger cities. As few concentration centers as possible were established, and only at locations with rail junctions. The Vansay Conference, held on January the 20th, 1942, sought to implement the final solution to the Jewish question. European Jews would thus be uprooted from their communities sent to extermination camps in Poland, and eliminated. This was to become an efficient method of genocide, often in collusion with the local population. Ten days after the Wannsee Conclave, Hitler spoke at the Spo Sports Palace in Berlin, informing his listeners, The war will not end as the Jews imagine it will, namely with the uprooting of the Aryans, but the result of this war will be the complete annihilation of the Jews. And, world Jews may as well know this, the further these battles spread, the more anti-Semitism will spread. It will find nourishment in every prison camp and in every family when it discovers the ultimate reason for the sacrifices it has to make. And the hour will come when the most evil universal enemy of all time will be finished at least for a thousand 
years. Words cannot convey the ineffable horrors that took place in the concentration camps, in which prisoners were subject to every unspeakable means of torture and death. Juxtaposed with these measures of brutality were the means of deception instituted to deny the depths of barbarism that were commonplace within the camps. One survivor, who survived the horrors of the concentration camp to give his testimony at the Nuremberg Tribunal, recalled the incidents at Treblinka. Because little children at their mother's breasts were a great nuisance during the shaving procedure, later the system was modified and babies were taken from their mothers as soon as they got off the train. The children were taken to an enormous ditch. When a large number of them were gathered together, they were killed by firearms and thrown into the fire. Here, too, no one bothered to see whether all the children were really dead. Sometimes one could hear infants wailing in the fire. When mothers succeeded in keeping their babies with them, and this fact interfered with the shaving, a German guard took the baby by its legs and smashed it against the wall of the barracks until only a bloody mass remained in his hands. The unfortunate mother had to take this mass with her to the bath. Only those who saw these things with their own eyes will believe with what delight the Germans performed these operations. How glad they were when they succeeded in killing a child with only three or four blows. With what satisfaction they pushed the baby's corpse into the mother's arms. The invalids, cripples and aged, who could not move fast enough, were put to death in the same way as the children. The ditch in which the children and infirm were slaughtered and burned was called in German the Lazaret Infirmary, and the workers employed in it wore armbands with the Red Cross sign.
music was a lifeline for victims of the Holocaust. According to Joseph Rudofsky, music in the Holocaust served a dual purpose. On the one hand, the songs expressed the anguish of the situation, agony for which words alone were an inadequate vehicle. On the other hand, music was the means by which the dehumanized could maintain their humanity, the link that allowed the condemned to cling to life. This is music that is optimistic and life-affirming. As Theresen survivor Greta Hoffmeister stated so powerfully, music, music was life. By 1940, many of the larger concentration camps already had their own orchestras. The music the inmates performed ranged from popular pre-war songs to opera and operetta, folk music, standard classical repertoire, marches, choral music, and dance melodies. Many new songs and works were created in the camps and ghettos. Partisans in the ghettos and political prisoners in the camps used songs to promote narratives of optimism and solidarity and to encourage others to join the opposition. Between 1940 and 1943, five orchestras of various sizes were established by the SS in the main camp at Auschwitz and at Birkenau. Several additional ensembles were established at Monowitz and other satellite camps, becoming a prominent feature of daily life. The orchestras were comprised of both amateur and professional musicians drawn from all sectors of the prison population. Musicians and singers were considered privileged in the camp hierarchy, a status that saved many lives. Music was one of the many activities tolerated by the SS precisely because by diverting their attention from what was really happening to them, it helped to deflect any urge on the part of the victims to resist. At Birkenau, for example, new camp arrivals were greeted with a reassuring scheme of deception as to what was really happening in the camp. Neatly groomed gardens, signposts indicating bath and changing rooms, and a performing orchestra that made it easier to gain the cooperation of the prisoners. The musical life that grew up in Auschwitz was embodied in the prisoner orchestras, which played at the camp gates each morning and evening as the laborers marched to and from work and regularly accompanied executions. In the main camp, the SS commissioned the prisoners to regularly perform concerts on Sunday afternoons for entertainment. The SS also imposed forced singing sessions and torture sessions in which music was used in sadistic ways. Prisoners were forced to sing during the roll call and while marching to and from work. The repertoire consisted of German soldiers' songs and sentimental songs and a specially composed hymn nicknamed the Anthem of Treblinka. SS tolerance for musical activities in ghettos and concentration camps was due in part to the realization that music assisted in maintaining order, calm, and compliance. Songs could help inmates reconnect with their pre-war lives or provide an escape from their present reality. In addition to Auschwitz, five camps were specifically designated as death camps, Belzig, Sobibor, Treblinko, Jamno, and Majdanek. In Treblinka, New arrivals were greeted with a perfectly designed scenario, a train station with signposts, train timetables and waiting areas, and a 10-piece uniformed orchestra conducted by the Jewish inmate Arthur Gold playing jazz and Jewish folk tunes. An eyewitness account from 1944 described a scene from Birkenau. We saw the unsealing of the coaches and the soldiers ordering men, women, and children out of them. We then witnessed heart-rending scenes, old couples forced to part from each other, mothers made to abandon their young daughters, since the latter were sent to the camp, whereas mothers and children were sent to the gas chambers. All these people were unaware of the fate awaiting them. They were merely upset at being separated, but they did not know that they were going to their death. 
to render their welcome more pleasant at this time, June, July, 1944, an orchestra composed of internees, all young and pretty girls, dressed in little white blouses and navy blue skirts, played during the selection on the arrival of the trains, gay tunes such as the Merry Widow, the Barcarolle from the Tales of Hoffman, etc. They were then informed that this was a labor camp, and since they were not brought into the camp, they only saw the small platform surrounded by flowering plants. Naturally, they could not realize what was in store for them. Philip Mueller described a group of Czech Jews from the family camp about to die in the gas chambers in Birkenau in July of 1944. The family camp was established in September of 1943 to allow families to stay together and all to refute reports of mass murders of Jews at Auschwitz in case the International Red Cross visited the premises. At last, they had been told, straight to their faces, what awaited them. Their voices grew subdued and tense, their movements forced, their eyes stared as though they had been hypnotized. The atmosphere in the room was one of immense gravity. Most of the people now began to undress, but some were still hesitating. Suddenly a voice began to sing, others joined in, and the sound swelled into a mighty choir. They sang first the Czechoslovak national anthem, and then the Hebrew song, Hatikva. And all this time the SS men never stopped their brutal beatings. It was as if they regarded the singing as a last kind of protest, which they were determined to stifle if they could. To be allowed to die together was the only comfort left to these people. Singing their national anthem, they were saying a last farewell to their brief but flourishing past, a past which had enabled them to live for 20 years in a democratic state, a respected minority enjoying equal rights. And when they sang Hatikva, now the national anthem of the state of Israel, they were glancing into the future, but it was a future which they would not be allowed to see. To me, the bearing of my countrymen seemed an exemplary gesture of national honor and national pride, which stirred my soul. On the eve of World War II, 
Warsaw's Jewish population was the largest and most socially diverse in Europe. By the time the ghetto was established in November 1940, the Jewish population numbered well over 400,000. Warsaw contained the largest number of Yiddish speakers in Europe and was the leading center for Yiddish culture. A cultural heritage was deeply rooted in this diversity. The Warsaw Ghetto offered a symphony orchestra, several Polish and Yiddish theaters, choral groups, and numerous concerts. For many, however, the only musical sounds in the ghetto were those of beggars singing for money on the streets or the occasional free concerts in the soup kitchens. Children consisted of the majority of beggars. On May 1, 1943, as the resistance continued in the Warsaw Ghetto, a group of Jewish writers and poets had gathered in the Vilna Ghetto for an evening to elaborate on the theme Spring in Yiddish Literature. Vilna had historically boasted one of the most vibrant Eastern European Jewish communities to the extent that it was dubbed the Jerusalem of Lithuania. The fighting in the Warsaw Ghetto had inspired every speaker and every poem. At the conclave, the poet Schmerke Kaczynski asked his friend and fellow poet Hirsch Glick how he was doing. I wrote a new poem, Glick replied. Want to hear it? Glick brought the poem to Kaczynski's room the next morning. Now listen carefully, he told his friend. I'll sing it for you. His friend later recalled. He began to sing it softly, but full of excitement. His eyes glowed with little sparks. The hour for which we yearned will come anew. Where did he get his faith? His voice became firmer. He tapped out the rhythm with his foot, as if he were marching. The song, Never Say That You Are Walking the Final Road, became the official song of the United Partisan Organization. Based on a popular Soviet melody by Soviet Jewish composers Dmitri and Daniel Pokras, it spread throughout the ghettos and camps and became known as the Song of the Partisans. Never say that you have reached the very end, though leaden skies a bitter fortune may portend, and the hour for which we've yearned will yet arrive, and our marching step will thunder, we survive. From green palm trees to the land of distant snow, we are here with our sorrow, our woe, and wherever our blood was shed in pain, our fighting spirits will now resurrect again. The golden rays of morning sun will dry our tears, dispelling bitter agony of yesteryears. But if the sun and dawn with us will be delayed, then let this song ring out to you the call instead. Not lead, but blood inscribed this mighty song we sing. It's not a caroling of birds upon the wing, but a people midst the crashing fires of hell sang this song with guns in hand until it fell. Armed resistance during the Holocaust was rare and often unsuccessful. Jewish resistance movements usually happened in areas of mass concentration, ghettos or camps. But even in these places, resistance was seldom employed. Most people were incredulous as to what was happening to them, 
even when information about the death camps was emerging. Taking advantage of this denial, the Nazis employed deception in order to intensify the uncertainty and confusion and thus discourage organized resistance. Those who engaged in resistance endangered not only themselves, but the entire community, thanks to a calculated policy of collective responsibility. In rare cases where a decision to resist was made, many groups were unorganized and unprepared. These revolts were almost always acts of desperation, carried out when there was no foreseeable hope for survival. Nevertheless, acts of resistance and defiance grew as it became evident that the brutality and barbarism against the Jews would not cease. On January 18, 1943, after nearly four months without having made a single deportation of occupants to the concentration camps, the Germans entered the Warsaw Ghetto to embark upon a deportation to Treblinka. Instead, they were met with an unexpectedly fierce resistance as some groups had made preparations to fight the Germans throughout the autumn and winter. Those who had no weapons armed themselves with lengths of iron pipe, sticks, bottles, whatever could serve to attack the enemy. The fighters set up a barricade in a little house on Niska Street and held it against the German reinforcements which soon arrived. The Germans found it impossible to enter the house, so they set it afire. The fighters inside continued firing until the last bullet. I should like to mention here one of the fighters, Elik. When he was mortally wounded, he asked one of the comrades to take his rifle so that it should not fall into German hands. Of the entire unit, only one survived. In the final stage of the battle, he fought with a rifle which he forced out of the hands of a German. Though the unit was destroyed, the battle on Niska Street encouraged us. For the first time since the occupation, we saw Germans clinging to walls, crawling on the ground, running for cover, hesitating before making a step in the fear of being hit by a Jewish bullet. The cries of the wounded caused us joy and increased our thirst for battle. Twelve German soldiers were killed in the fighting, according to one survivor. SS agents who stood some distance away and many soldiers who fled in confusion cried out, The Jews are shooting! I myself heard these astonished cries from the lips of a vile, loathsome German as he ran down the stairs of the house which he had entered for the deliberate purpose of killing us. The Jews are shooting, he cried out in utter bewilderment. Something unheard of. Jews firing. They have guns. The Germans, someone later wrote, had received their first blow at the hands of the contemptible Juden. Most of the Jews seized in the Warsaw Ghetto, as the revolt was crushed, were deported to Treblinka and gassed, while others were sent to Majdanek or to labor camps in the Lublin region. How a nation with such a rich cultural history as Germany could possibly descend to such depths of barbarism as was demonstrated during the Nazi regime is one of the most troubling aspects of the Holocaust. At the Nuremberg trial, Albert Speer, 
Hitler's chief architect and later minister of armaments, reflected on the unprecedented enormity of the crimes committed during the reign of Nazi terror. During that accursed era, a factor in addition to human depravity had entered history, the factor that distinguished our tyranny from all historical precedents, and a factor that would inevitably increase in importance in the future. The criminal events of those years were not only an outgrowth of Hitler's personality. The extent of the crimes was also due to the fact that Hitler was the first to be able to employ the implements of technology to multiply crime. In his final speech to the tribunal, Speer articulated his observations. Hitler's dictatorship was the first dictatorship of an industrial state in this age of modern technology, a dictatorship which employed to perfection the instruments of technology to dominate its own people. By means of such instruments of technology as the radio and public address systems, 80 million persons could be made subject to the will of one individual. Telephone, teletype, and radio made it possible to transmit the commands of the highest levels directly to the lowest organs, where, because of their high authority, they were executed uncritically. Thus many offices and squads received their evil commands in this direct manner. The instruments of technology made it possible to maintain a close watch over all citizens and to keep criminal operations shrouded in a high degree of secrecy. To the outsider, this state apparatus may look like the seemingly wild tangle of cables in a telephone exchange, but like such an exchange, it could be directed by a single will. Dictatorships of the past needed assistance of high quality in the lower ranks of the leadership also, men who could think and act independently. The authoritarian system in the age of technology can do without such men. The means of communication alone enable it to mechanize the work of the lower leadership. Thus the type of uncritical receiver of orders is created. It certainly begs the question as to whether any nation or group of people has the potential to repeat these atrocities, albeit with modifications as to the time and circumstances. Frederick Douglass wrote, the life of the nation is secure only while the nation is honest, truthful, and virtuous. Such high-minded principles cannot be upheld over time and circumstances. In 1787, Alexander Tyler, a Scottish historian at the University of Edinburgh, suggested that the average lifespan of the world's greatest civilizations is about 200 years. During this time, the nation experiences a life cycle, from bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy to dependence, from dependency back to bondage, from bondage back to spiritual faith. Sir John Bagot Glubb, a highly honored British general and historian, better known as Glubb Pasha, described in his book, The Fate of Empires and the Search for Survival, 1978, a common pattern that some empires of the past have followed. The age of outburst or the pioneer stage the age of conquests, the age of commerce, the age of affluence, the age of intellect, the age of decadence, the age of decline and collapse. On October 22nd, 1925, Mohandas K. Gandhi described in his weekly newspaper, Young India, seven social sins that will destroy a society. Wealth without work. Pleasure 
without conscience, knowledge without character, commerce without morality, science without humanity, religion without sacrifice, politics without principle. But the overriding message that the Holocaust has conveyed to the ages is the resilience and strength of the human spirit. As Zenetic Lederer, a survivor of the Dorlesienstadt ghetto and of Auschwitz wrote, it has been the lot of the Jews to deliver to men a warning that violence is in the end self-destructive, power futile, and the human spirit unconquerable. 
in a dark cellar in a church in Cologne, where Jews hid from the Nazis. An unknown author, who probably lost his or her life, wrote these words on the wall. I believe in the sun, even when it is not shining. I believe in love, even when I cannot feel it. I believe in God, even when God is silent.